I'm Rob Fennell, and I teach theology here, and it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Bull, who's our first presenter this morning. Michelle's project title is God Gathering and Going Deep, Not Gimmicks, Guitars, or Gadgets. So not only does it appeal to my love of alliteration, but it uh, promises to offer us a lot about the current state of affairs in our parishes and churches, and I'm really looking forward to what you have to share, Michelle. It's all yours. Good morning. Thank you for those kind words, Rob, and thank you to everyone for coming. I really appreciate it very much. I don't imagine that it would be much of a surprise to people if I said that the church attendance in the Anglican Church, which is what I'm studying, has been declining over the last 50 years. We all know this. And people have been studying this trend because it's of critical importance that we figure out why people stop attending church. However, it seems to me to be just as important to ask why people come. In the midst of these somewhat depressing statistics, there are people who buck the trend. There are people who were not taken to church as children who have decided to start attending and have become involved. And I was curious about this. Why, in an age of increasing secularization, would people start going to church? What would bring them in the first place? What would that experience be like for them? And what would they find there that would compensate them for not being able to sleep in on a Sunday morning? You might imagine that this would be a question which would also interest the church. Since we do have the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, to baptize people and teach them to keep Jesus' commandments. And also, there's an increasing number of people who have no church background, and we would like them to come to church. So it seems like it would be a good idea to find out why they come if they do come. But although there are a lot of books on how to do evangelism, there have been surprisingly few studies on what actually works, and none that I could find on this specific question, although there are some related studies. So I decided to find some people who had no significant church background and who had started attending the Anglican Church in Nova Scotia and kept attending for at least a year. I interviewed each person. I asked them generally what brought them to church the first time, what that was like for them, and why they continued to attend. This was a phenomenological study looking for the subjective experience of the participants and the meaning they assigned to that experience. I asked open-ended questions, and I looked for themes. And there was surprising similarity amongst them, and many similarities with the data in the other studies that I looked at, although they came, came from a, a slightly different focus. So let me introduce you to my five participants and why they came to church initially. They're all from the HRM area, and my participants picked saints for pseudonyms. St. Paul of Tarsus is a 54-year-old man who's been a Christian now for about 16 years. He's married, and when he started attending church, he had small children. He mainly attended one church where he and his wife taught Sunday school, where he also played guitar. He's recently moved to a different church where he's more involved in the liturgy. Paul started coming to church because he got talking to a neighbor about God and religion, and the neighbor said, you should come to my church. It's a good church. So he came, and he stayed, and he was baptized less than a year later. St. Francis of Assisi is a 24-year-old man who started attending King's College about seven years ago. He's become very involved in the King's Chapel community, attending worship services several times a week, and many other activities, including retreats, lectures, and concerts. He went initially because one of his friends told him, Hey, there's an after dark candlelight plane chanting service. That sounds really cool. Let's go. So they went. They enjoyed themselves, but they didn't return. Several months later, a prof told him, Hey, you have to go hear the choir. So he went from time to time, and he enjoyed it. He also went on a retreat just to get out of the city. Later, the prof he was TAing for asked him to make and deliver bulletins for Sunday worship. 
And he figured, well, if he was there, he might as well stay. For Francis, the process was pretty gradual. He was baptized in epiphany of his third year, about two years after he first went to chapel. St. Gertrude of Nivelle is a 29-year-old woman who also came to faith at King's College Chapel. She continues to attend there when her work schedule allows it. She also attends two other churches in the city, one traditional, one contemporary. She's been a server, she's involved in community activities, and she started attending early in her first year. She lived in residence, and she kept hearing bells and wondering what they were. And one day she got a pamphlet under her door and it said, have you been hearing bells? <laughs> what are those bells? It said they were announcing services at the chapel and it described the services and invited students to attend. So the next time she heard the bell and was free, she went to the service and she kept going, liking it so much that she skipped classes to attend. <laughs> she was baptized within a few months. St. Dimda is a 36-year-old woman. She's been attending an active church with very contemporary worship for five or six years. She's extremely active in Bible study, Christian education, lay reading, cursio, parish council, youth group, and messy church. She can't get enough church. She started going because her doctor asked her, why don't you find God? So she set out to do that, and she ended up at this church. It's a somewhat unusual prescription, but it's one that worked well for Dimpna. <laughs> She'd been baptized as a baby and was confirmed a year after starting to attend. St. Teresa of Avila is a 39-year-old woman who's been attending church about seven years, and during that time she and her family attended two Anglican churches, and within the last few months they've actually become members of a Roman Catholic church. Her involvement has been primarily as a Sunday school teacher and youth group leader, and she also hosted a Bible study. Unlike the others, Teresa started attending church because of a theological problem. Her daughter asked her five-year-old daughter just before Christmas, Mommy, is Santa God? Teresa knew that Santa wasn't God, but she didn't feel she had any clear sense of who God was. And she didn't feel equipped to discuss this. So she and her husband looked for a local church with a good children's program. They started attending right after Christmas, and they were baptized at Easter that year. There are a couple things worth noting. Four out of five of these people were invited to church, two of them directly, one by a pamphlet, and one obliquely. The implications here for the church seem pretty clear to me. If we want people to come to church, we might want to try inviting them. Uh, it's effective. And we also need to welcome them when they come. All my participants felt welcomed, which might be why they stayed. It's also worth noting that three of them, Paul, Dimpna, and Teresa, said they had felt a prior pull towards church or towards God, but they might not have done anything about it if they'd not had that impetus. I believe that the overarching message of the Bible is that God loves us and desires to be in a relationship with us. The Hebrew Bible is largely about God trying to draw the children of Israel into faithful relationship. The incarnation is an indication that God will go to extravagant lengths to form this relationship. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus promises his disciples the relationship will last in John 14, 23. Those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. St. Augustine says at the beginning of the confessions that we have an innate desire for God. You've made us and drawn us to yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So it's not surprising that these people felt a draw to God. However, they still needed an invitation to church. The last thing I'll note here is that all of my participants saw baptism or confirmation as a step along the path, not the end point. Francis said, I figured if I was going to church every Sunday and making bulletins and doing all the rest of the stuff and was kind of thinking differently too, like I found myself thinking a little bit more religiously, a little bit more spiritually, 
yeah, I figured I should probably get baptized. And later he said, so I think I was trying to articulate how you need God's, you need help. It's not just about your own strength, doing the thing that's good and right and living the good life, because I found that wasn't working, believe it or not. So Francis saw baptism as a means of getting help to live his newfound spiritual life, and so did Teresa. She said, I remember saying to the priest, I just don't know if I'm ready for this, you know? Like, this is a big deal, right? It's only been a few months, and I don't feel prepared. And he talked to me about how baptism is a gift. And when we receive the Holy Spirit like this, it's just a sign that we're open to receive. And certainly I remember feeling that I am ready, because I really want this in my life. I'm really open to this, and I really want to receive the grace that's available to me. The implication of this is that the church needs to be more intentional in continuing to offer education and formation opportunities to people after they make a faith commitment in baptism or confirmation, rather than just before. I asked the participants what it was like for them to become part of the church, and what were the benefits and drawbacks. I asked what they really valued about their church involvement and what they didn't care for. I asked if they considered themselves Christians, and they all do, and what that meant for them. Three main themes emerged from this. My participants came to church because of God, gathering in community, and an opportunity for going deep. So let's look at these in turn. All my participants had a sense of God's presence in their lives, and they all seemed quite sure what they meant by that, but none of them found it easy to articulate. Dimpna started attending specifically because she was looking for God, as her doctor suggested she should do. Here's her story. I drove around my town looking for God. I passed some churches. I somehow out of nowhere pulled into St. Someone's parking lot, sat, turned off my car, and just sat. Parking lot was empty. It was dark. It started snowing. It was cold. And after a couple minutes, I'm like, I'm cold. I'm going home. But in those couple minutes of me sitting there, it was the first time I think I met God. I can say I met God there. I didn't realize it at the time. What was that like? It was very peaceful and calming, and even though it was a lonely, dark parking lot, I didn't feel alone. I felt comforted. Paul has similar language describing an encounter with God at a summer camp. I often talk about a kind of conversion moment or an important moment being a small boy on a hill with a lot of the tall grasses of the Canadian summer blowing around me, and I felt God's presence and Jesus Christ's presence as, you know, with you, comforting you, present. And when people ask you to pinpoint something, I pinpoint that. He now describes what it means to be Christian in more theological language. Well, I used to just say follower of Jesus Christ, but I'm increasingly thinking it's more like being incorporated into the body and essence of who Jesus Christ is. I don't view Jesus Christ as a wise teacher that I follow. It's a way of being that is Jesus, and it's more relational, Trinitarian. Teresa also talks about this union with Jesus. She says being a Christian means that I have Christ at the center of my life, or as close to the center of my life as I can get him, given my own inability to get it, let him in there. Francis says about being a Christian, I guess that means, to me means, that's who I turn to for help. That's who I strive to emulate. Yeah, it's just that I'm human, and that I need help. And that, and he's the dude I turn to. And he goes on to say, I've come to see that you have to develop and grow your relationship with God, and to see that he's there for you. And he comes in crazy weird forms. And sometimes he comes as a man, and sometimes he's just kind of there, and that's great. Gertrude said about her baptism, I wanted to publicly acknowledge and shout from the mountaintops that I was happy to love God, and happy to be loved by God, and happy to love others. So Paul, Dimpna, and Francis all talked about finding God's presence in other people, seeking it there, and Paul said particularly in the poor. All five of them described God's presence as comfort or solace. All but Francis talked of peacefulness and calm. 
Dimpna, Teresa, and Paul said it included gratitude. Paul, Dimpna, and Francis said there was a sense of presence, of not being alone. And Dimpna and Gertrude spoke of love. This corresponds with our theology. Christians believe in God as Trinity, three persons and one God. Loving relationship is essential to who God is. And we believe that God invites us into that relationship, drawing us into that love. Anglican scholar Sister Constance Joanna Geffert in The Ancient Paths, Spirituality for Mission, speaks of God's longing for us and our longing for God as the root of our faith life, in fact, as being at the heart of who we are as human beings. Geffert says that this deep connection with God leads us inevitably into mission, particularly in community, and that this in turn draws us back more deeply into the mystery of God. This has implications for us. If many people are looking for and value an experience of God, we as churches need to ask ourselves whether or not we ourselves have this experience of God. And if so, how do we communicate it with others? And if not, why not? And how might we have that experience? Paul suggested that church communities should be centered in their spirituality, in the Holy Spirit, they should be undergirded with prayer in all their activities. The next theme was gathering in community. Theologically, Christian community springs directly from our relationship with God. If we're all drawn into relationship with God, then we're also necessarily in relationship with one another. We're all part of the body of Christ. As St. Paul says in Romans 12, 5, we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we're members of one another. As one body, we're called to love one another, as Jesus commanded. Anglican Tractarian Edward Pusey preached eloquently of the church as the current site of Christ's incarnation. Christ dwells within us, and the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And as the current site of the incarnation, the church, the body of Christ, is tasked with Jesus' mission in the world, inviting others into relationship with God. And my participants seem to understand this. Many of them expressed the idea that as they were loved in the community of the church, so they were able to receive, understand, and accept the love of God. They found the presence and love of God in the community of the church, and they also understood their response to include loving God and loving others. For all of my participants, belonging to the community was extremely important. All of them described their church as welcoming, caring, loving, and supportive. Although one person was involved in a serious, unresolved conflict in their church, which colored their perception for a while and gave them quite a lot of pain. All of them used the word welcoming many times and really valued that. And this is heartening news for our church. All except Paul said that they were looking for the kind of community that would accept people as they were. I discovered during my interviews that two of my participants have mental health issues and one is homosexual. On the whole, they found this acceptance in the church, which is good news for the church, I think. One of those with mental health struggles did not always find that people accepted that, especially some clergy, interestingly, although others did. All the participants except Gertrude noted that one thing they really valued in the community was the opportunity to use their gifts, to have their gifts and abilities noticed and valued by the community. And being asked to contribute was part of the process of becoming part of the community. And they came up with all these things independently without prompting. So the implications of this are not all that hard to figure out, I think. Pretty much every study, including mine, shows that people come to church because they want community, belonging. So our theology shows how central that is, and obviously, it seems to me, the churches should be fostering that sense of community. That community should include social activities, but also spiritual activities, including worship, but also including mutual prayer. And all those activities should include warmth, welcome, and acceptance. The other thing people wanted from their church community was the opportunity to go deep. This included three things. Learning about the faith, 
the opportunity to really wrestle with how to apply that faith to their own rather messy lives, and the opportunity for transformation and growth. Gertrude didn't talk about this much, but the others did. All my participants came to church with no background. Most of them didn't even know basic Bible stories. They wanted to learn. Dimna said, I'm ready to re re want more. I craved more, so I started doing Bible study in the evenings, just kind of trying to get as much knowledge, and I just needed more and more and more and more. And then I did the lay readers program. She goes on, long list. <laughs> both, um, both Paul and Teresa were asked to teach Sunday school within a year and a half of first coming to church because they had kids. Neither of them felt at all equipped to teach since they knew so little. They were told they would learn by preparing the curriculum and both had mentors for a while. They both found this a valuable way to learn and both seem to have done a good job. But personally, I think this is maybe a bit of a questionable practice on the part of the church, although it seems to have worked in these cases. None of my participants were content with gaining information about the Bible and liturgy and so on. They wanted to be able to engage the material in a real way, to wrestle with what difference it made in their own lives and how it could be applied. Interestingly, both Francis and Teresa said that it was in engaging in this practice that they began to overcome their previous negative stereotypes of Christians. Apparently, putting on a good front is less attractive than allowing people to see our questions, struggles, and vulnerabilities. People wanted to be able to talk about any topic ask any question. They weren't particularly worried about answers and they were much more interested in engaging the questions. Francis says, my faith has helped me come to a standpoint that doesn't necessarily give me all the answers or give me any of the answers, but helps me ask the questions, see the questions and be in conversation with other people. So trying to, to sorry, Dimna says about the Bible study, so trying to fit it into today's modern world, yeah, kind of looking at his word and then interpreting it for myself, and how does it fit into my interpretation, and my interpretation can be totally different from your interpretation, but that's all right, because that's how you see it. This has a lot of implications for the church and for preachers and teachers, in my opinion. If people want to engage material in a real gutsy way rather than being given pat answers or easy answers, if they want to know how this can really be applied to their own messy lives rather than being given some sort of pious but unlivable platitudes, then maybe many preachers and teachers might want to think about changing their style. From my reading too, it seems that if preachers and teachers don't do this, if they don't try to see how the Bible teachings might be applied to our real lives, then people start to think that they're irrelevant to their real lives, and there seems little point in continuing with church. It seems it might be more appealing to people to raise questions from the pulpit rather than giving answers. In my opinion, the church needs to start engaging people deeply and honestly in questions of faith and its application with a much greater tolerance for ambiguity and unanswered questions than we currently have. We need to admit that living the faith is really difficult. My participants were also looking for transformation. They wanted to understand themselves better and they wanted to be transformed and to transform their relationships and their lives. They wanted a disciplined faith and practice, something challenging. Teresa talked a lot about being pushed outside her comfort zone, which is where she thinks growth happens. She's grateful for that in her church. She says, and I think too, learning on a personal level about myself and about what my strengths and weaknesses are, where my fears and vulnerabilities are, where I need to push myself in order to keep growing as a person, these are all things that are for me part of the ongoing learning. And I think that becoming accustomed to a life of that kind of learning is part of the discipline of faith. Francis quotes St. Paul, Romans 12, 12. I mean, to me, being a Christian very much means that I'm sort of striving to be not conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of my mind and whatever else. Yeah, to be like him. He talked like that. Paul talks a lot about the importance of teaching newcomers. 
He thinks the church should be paying attention to each individual person and thinking what they need for their growth rather than just putting them in a job and leaving them there because they can do it. He says, I wouldn't wait long after an adult walks in the door before offering them a practice. See how quickly people can go into a course where they talk about some different prayer options. And while Paul thinks this is critical for newcomers, he would like to see it for everyone else too. Dimna talks about the transformation she's seen in herself and how her self-perception has changed because of being in the church. I value myself, which I don't think I would have said that five years ago. I probably wouldn't have said it three years ago. I value who I am, who I was, because obviously you have to take some time to think about who you were and who I'm going to be. I value myself as who they, meaning church members, see me as, even though there are tough days, I know I can get over it because I have the skills and the ways and the tools to go through it. But I am who I am and I'm liking who I am. Yeah, I am, I'm liking who I am, who I'm becoming every day in my growth because I'm growing every day. Gertrude found forgiveness and greater acceptance through the church. She mentions this a couple times. The priest made me, and I mean made me, see that no sin is too big. He was like, what? Do you think it's too big? Yeah, you think some things are unforgivable, don't you? Well, it ain't. <laughs> she laughs and she says that was part of the pivotal point, was that someone loves you a lot. She also goes to confession and founds that, finds that really helpful. Both Francis and Teresa said that their becoming Christian had helped with their relationships, all of them, said directly or indirectly that they particularly valued the opportunity to help and serve other people and develop their innate ability to love others. All of them had a disciplined spiritual practice. Paul mentions, meditates or prays every day and reads the scriptures. Teresa reads the scriptures. Francis attends worship frequently, sometimes daily. Gertrude does when she can and uses the sacrament of reconciliation. Dimpna has a daily devotional reading and prayer practice, and that's just what they told me about in passing because I didn't ask. What are the implications? It seems that people want to learn how to pray, they want disciplined spiritual practices, they want to grow and be transformed, they want their relationships with others to be transformed, and yet I find that the church often tries to make things easy for people and doesn't give them spiritual practices or challenge them to a more disciplined life. People also really valued the opportunity to use their gifts and talents to serve others, and we should give them that opportunity. In summary, there was a surprising uniformity of answers among my participants, significant because they were asked open questions. They all wanted a relationship with God, they all wanted authentic community, and they all wanted an opportunity to learn, to engage difficult questions, and be transformed. No one was looking for a facile, watered-down faith. None of them were attracted by gimmicks, guitars, or gadgets. The only one who mentioned music as an attraction was Francis, who as a teenager was attracted to traditional choral music. Dimta mentioned PowerPoint made the service easier to follow, but she preferred her church grandparents who sat with her the first service and navigated her through the service. No one mentioned attractive web pages, although Teresa probably looked online to find a church. This doesn't mean we shouldn't have these things, but they're not some kind of magic formula to attract people. It didn't seem to matter what sort of service they went to. The three churches had primarily contemporary worship sometimes with a band instead of an organ. King's College Chapel uses a traditional form of worship in Elizabethan language with a choir singing in Latin half the time, and both were attractive. I read a, a Church of England study that said the style of worship was not related to growth, but the church's wholehearted adoption of that style was. In other words, if the community enjoys and participates fully in their worship and does it well, that's more important than what the worship is. And this is shown by the fact that King's College Chapel, which has been described as antiquated, also seems to be a beacon of evangelism in this diocese. The conclusion I draw from all these things, and this is corroborated by the other studies I read, is, is that the most attractive thing we can do as a church 
is to actually be the church, do the work of the church, worship, pray, teach, challenge people, become faithful disciples, nurture our own relationship with God and the community, honestly explore our own faith and its implications, seek to transform our own lives, and then lovingly invite people into this. This seems to be what people are looking for. It's amazingly simple and incredibly hard to do. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I, I kind of like the approach of the bells, you know, uh, you know, playing the bells and then sliding the, the note. Are you hearing bells? You're not crazy. You are hearing bells. I, I don't know what that would be in my tradition. But. And, and then the whole idea that people can't get enough of church. Wow. That'd Young be great. people. Young, can't get enough of church, yeah. That sounds like the early uh, catechumens at some point. Questions and comments? Katie has one over there. Oh, sorry. I'm wondering, um, did any? Is it, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm wondering, did any of the participants talk about not ever feeling welcome, or not feeling like, or ever struggling to share some of those gifts, or have people identify gifts and welcome to be involved in the church? Did any of them talk about? situations where it was more difficult for them to do that? Or, or did all of them, were all of them welcome with open arms into the That's one of the bits I had to, had to leave out, so thank you for asking that. Um, Mostly people were welcomed when they got there. The three women all expressed that they were quite nervous about going to church the first time. Um, I don't know if the men felt that too, but they didn't say so. Um, they found it a little daunting. Uh, Teresa said she was afraid she would be judged because she didn't know what to do. Um, on the other hand, none of them seemed to feel an expectation that they would understand everything immediately. They recognized they were new there, and they, they didn't expect to get what was going on immediately. Um, three of them, two, two of them had somebody invite them to come and sit with them and showed them that, you know, Anglican churches, you've got like three books going, you've got um, standing, sitting, kneeling, all that stuff. It's difficult. It's, it's difficult. So, so they had someone sit with them and say, oh, this is where we are, this, uh, and that they found really, really helpful. Um, Teresa, when she first went, was welcomed by a lady in the, in the aisle. I don't know if she was the official greeter or not, but she warmly welcomed her, and, and Teresa confided in her that she was feeling anxious because she didn't know what to do with church, and, uh, and the lady said, don't worry about that, dear. We're just so happy you and your family are here, you know? Don't worry about getting it wrong or whatever. And that really helped her, and that woman also was the one who kept drawing her in. So there were cases where people didn't feel entirely comfortable. There were um, one of the ladies who had, there you go. One of the people with, with, mental, with mental health issues said there were times when she felt unwelcome because of that. But other than that, mostly people felt welcomed. The, the only time they had real trouble with the church was when they felt the church wasn't practicing what it preached. And, and even then, they felt a pretty high tolerance for general human brokenness. Um, they weren't expecting perfection. Francis said, could I do better if I was the Archbishop of Canterbury? I don't think so. When the, church, uh, when the church didn't follow its own procedures and didn't even live up to secular standards, as in the case of the person who had a serious conflict, that was distressing. That was distressing. But other than that, no. Um, people, I think some of the people, um, particularly Paul, would have liked more teaching earlier on about what was going on. But uh, generally, people felt welcomed. Just to take it one step further, in the back of your mind, you knew where your thesis was going. Would you have asked those candidates 
Would you turn around and invite someone to come to church with you by any chance? I didn't ask no, them that. I wouldn't expect you would. I'm just curious. Um, Thank you. Some of them, in fact, did, though, mention that they had, in fact, invited other people to church. Some of them invited family members to church, which didn't always go that well. Uh, <laughs> some of their family were completely nonplussed that they'd started going to church. A lot of their parents had rejected church as children, so they were like, you're doing what? But, um, but yeah, some of them have invited people to church. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. That was interesting and challenging. Um, <laughs> Thank when you. I was in the same position as you, and I, I've been interviewing people, one of the questions I asked was, what part of the service do you enjoy most? I, I thought maybe, you know, receiving communion. The answer they gave me was the sermon, which totally shocked me. I thought people would be bored. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, why? And they said, because I don't understand the scriptures until I hear an explanation. And I was wondering if you got any sort of feedback about that uh, from your people. No. <laughs> um, one person said that they didn't always understand the sermons um, when they were too erudite. Um, but... Um, other than that, I don't think anyone particularly comment on it. Other times I've talked to people, I've got the same response, which also surprised me. Yeah, people actually look forward to sermons and, and like them. But I didn't ask that question, so. Uh, you, you mentioned um, that people felt a great sense of comfort being in the presence of God. Um, did anybody talk about um, feeling discomfort or feeling that God was agitating them in some way or that God was, was tr doing something, and, you know, messing with them, trying to, get, you know, <laughs> do something different, new in their lives? New in their lives, yes. Pushing them, yes. Um, drawing them along, yes, but not... Uh, messing with them, no. Um, they, a uh, one person, the 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 person who who was gay, uh, was afraid that the church would not accept that because that's what she'd been taught as a child. Well, when she went to high school, someone, some Christian person there, had said, you know, you're going to hell, and she didn't know if that would be acceptable to God, but when she confided that to the priest, he was like, so you're gay, who cares? I don't care. <laughs> and, uh, and that really transformed her. She realized that she was acceptable to God. So I know people didn't find that. They, they did find themselves being drawn and, and pushed to, to, uh, for, to transformation, but they didn't find themselves being in any way condemned or judged by God, and not very often by church either. There was a question over there. Sorry, and then I'll come back over here. Thank you. I couldn't help but notice that the newcomers that you interviewed were real keeners. Active prayer life, Bible study, like way probably, if you did a study, way more than the people who've been going all along. I think it's pretty significant, and I'm just curious about what you think the implications of that, uh, that fact would be. Well, two things. Um, for one thing, I think newcomers, and this would tie in with what Justin was saying last night, newcomers who, who are seeing things with fresh eyes are a really valuable resource for the church. You know, because we know how things have always been done and you don't even notice it. It's like when we were cleaning up this building, we discovered piles of stuff that were actually garbage that had been stuck somewhere and hadn't been dealt with. You know, you don't even notice stuff after a while. And newcomers look at it and they're like, why are you all worried about the wording of that? Like, do you realize no one cares? One of my participants said. Uh, <laughs> the world has moved on from that. Um, but the other thing is, I think, you know, looking for a grad project for another year, like here's an idea. Interview people who are, you know, over 60, have been going to church all their lives and ask them the same questions. What do you really value about church? Why do you come other than habit? Like, why do you come? 
And I think we might be surprised. I don't know what the answers are, but I was always surprised to discover that you know, elderly people that I thought were just good for making squares actually had incredible prayer practice. You know, so, but they never talked about it because they're Anglican, right? <laughs> so you know, we, don't, we don't know is the thing. So I mean, I think someone should study that because it would be really good to know. I don't think we need to cater only to newcomers in church. I think we do need to do that, but we also need to look after the needs of people who've been going all their lives. We can't abandon them. But let's find out what those needs are, because actually we don't know. We don't know what they really want. I think. One over here. It was already answered. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, back here. Is there an ecclesiological difference between a friendly church and a receptive church? I'm not sure what you mean by that. <laughs> Is there a difference between a friendly church and a receptive church? <laughs> what do you mean by a receptive church? So I think that a number of the parishes in the background of your profiles were sounded to me like receptive places, places where people were ready to um, engage people as they arrived, help them discover their faith, discover ways to express it, encourage them to discover the Christian way. Some of them were, some not so much. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I know what you're talking about now. Yes, one of the churches uh, was described as being incredibly friendly, very warm, very welcoming, lots of social stuff going on, but actually not all that good at uh, explaining things to newcomers, not all that good at um, giving spiritual practice to newcomers, not all that good at um, bringing people to faith, but really good at drawing them into the community but not so good at bringing them to faith. Um, other churches were way better at that, at bringing them to faith and in the community. So yes, there's a difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and I think, just to follow on, I think that, that's really key because we hear a lot of congregations and parishes call themselves friendly in kind of a self-congratulatory way, yeah. usually meaning we're friendly to the people we already know who are our friends. That's also true, yes. And I just think there's a distinction between that and the welcoming church or the receptive church or even the assimilating church that goes those extra steps beyond whatever friendly means mm. or doesn't mean. There was a question there and one there. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for your presentation. One of the things that, that caught me, uh, I think it was in your gathering, was the fact that your participants uh, expressed that they either felt free or they were invited to share their gifts. And that, that was very meaningful for them. And I believe it was Paul you said had been Im invited to, uh, to lead Sunday school. And I was, I, I'm really captured by that idea of sharing their gifts because I think one of the things can happen is people, people want to share but they don't know how to share and they're not invited to share. And I wondered if, in your conversations, if any of them expressed how they were invited to share, or did they take the initiative to share their gifts? And if they hadn't been able to share their gifts, would that have been a turnoff such that they would have left, not felt welcomed? Well, none of them went that far as to say that. Uh, Francis talked about this the most. Um, said that the people in the King's College Chapel community noticed that he had certain gifts and drew them out. Things that he might not have noticed himself, but that they were paying enough attention to him as a person that they recognized certain gifts and invited him to use them. Um, which is not necessarily the same as having an accountant join your church and immediately dumping them into the treasurer role. But, <laughs> right? But he, he, things that he, was, he found he was good at, and, and he didn't know that, that he was given the opportunity. So they took the initiative there. Um, that was also the case with Dimna, who for the church took the initiative to notice what she was good at. Um, 
Paul was given the opportunity, like he was asked to teach Sunday school, which he didn't feel was one of his gifts, but then it turned out to be one, um, to develop into one. And uh, I think Teresa also found that. She, she felt that most uncomfortable in those roles. And, then, and they didn't just give her the little kid class, they gave her the junior high class, right? <laughs> and she was like, oh, I don't even know the basic Bible stories. How am I going to teach these kids? But she did have a good mentor, and she discovered she didn't need to know all the answers. So that was helpful, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, I guess my perception is that there are always a lot of people in churches, whether they're newcomers or older or congregants who have been coming all along, who have a multiplicity of, of gifts or who want to be invited to participate in a way where they can share their gifts. And we're all given gifts mm -hmm. by God. Um, but they're nervous about offering them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and sometimes I don't think we do a very good job about inviting people to share their gifts and to recognizing their gifts. We think, well, we have them, but we don't acknowledge someone else's. No, it's and true. I, I think that's a problem. And it's also often hard for a newcomer to break into established patterns. You know, we've all heard the ACW who have the lock on the kitchen, you know. And the... For Dimna, I think for her, it was the church actually valued her gifts more than she did. And, and she came around to to understanding that her gifts were valuable because of the way they were valued by the people there. I think Lynn had a question. Uh, Michelle, I was intrigued by your um, kind of offhand challenge to others to do another project next year. Mm. And I just, I wanted to share very briefly, and then I have a question. I'm involved in a transition process in another denomination currently, and one of the th big pieces of it currently is gathering people in small groups and the opening question is what role does faith and spirituality play in your life mm -hmm. and these are uh, mostly people who've been who are over 60 have been around for a long time and it's incredible to see the transformation that's happening around that question so my question to you is it do you have a sense because you've been around the church a while do you have a sense that there is a different climate now to speak about faith that maybe wasn't there 10 years ago? To speak about faith? Mm -hmm. Spirituality, maybe. faith, your relationship maybe. with God? Hard to say, but maybe, yeah, because I think the fact that numbers have declined so much that people, Katie was talking yesterday about churches that have no, no full-time clergy now um, and how you know, they're scrambling to figure things out. People are seeing the writing on the wall, and I think in the fact that they're starting to feel enough afraid, they're willing to think outside the box of what they've always done. So I think there is more of a willingness to, to actually start addressing these questions. And besides, it's like a big thing in the church right now. We're, we talk about mission all the time, which was not the case 20 years ago. I, I don't remember ever hearing anyone talk about mission 20 years ago. Um, or almost ever. Now, every time you go to anything, that's what we're talking about, which is a good thing. And, and I think it's actually exactly what we need, is to start thinking about what we're supposed to be doing instead of bewailing the past. But, but yeah, I think there's more of an openness to, to think in different ways, outside the box and everything. I don't know how you're going to overcome Anglicans not wanting to talk about private stuff like faith, but... Um, but I think that's coming a little, and you can certainly do it in small groups and one-to-one, -one, yeah. Well, thank you, Michelle. That's um, been very, very informative. Um, and the, uh, that's a great question, Lynn, and I'd like to see more of that happening. Mm. And who knows, the Anglicans, you know, they could probably talk <laughs> about that. We will survive. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, and I do invite you over for some coffee, tea, refreshments, and another opportunity to speak with Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.